Hi. I work in this arena, and I have to tell you that I teeter between fury and despair because the society simply does not care about this part of life. We choose not to talk about it, and we choose to let it be the stepchild. And yet the majority of people here in the room will go through this part of life, and we will be rich enough to buy our way out of most of it, but most people are not. So here are some framing facts. Uh, this is the kind of thing that Cheryl and, um, and Barbara have just um, mentioned as well. We do not actually plan for at least two years on average of self-care disability. The average person now coming to retirement has $50,000 in savings. The average African American has less than $100 in savings. Boston Globe point, printed a report of the family wealth, the total assets of families in the Boston area. And they printed that it was around 250000 for a white family head of household and $8 for African-American head of household. They got a slew of uh, letters saying this has to be a typo. It is no typo. It is no typo. We have enormous numbers of people coming to old age without adequate retirement security, without assets, and facing long-term disability. And we are offering up a reduction in Medicare, a reduction in Medicaid. We are offering up no trained geriatricians. We are offering up cutting off immigration. We are offering up having smaller families more widely dispersed and older so the 96-year-old has a 70-year-old daughter who already can't do turning in bed. You know, we're used to thinking that the caregiver is a 45-year-old woman. No, no, no. Caregivers are getting older and older, too. This country has done extraordinarily badly on providing supports. This is a graph that top line is the rise in the costs that have been attributed to Medicare. That next line going up is the population. Notice how much more Medicare has increased compared to the population. But what's that bottom line? That's the federal commitment to long-term services and supports. That's the Older Americans Act. Not only is the Older Americans Act flat now, but the new proposal in the budget is to cut it in the face of doubling the number of frail elderly in the next 15 years. This is the OECD countries the top bars, the red lines, are how much is spent on social services, and the blue lines are how much is spent on medical care. We are a massive outlier. We spend nearly twice as much on medical care as the OECD average, and almost half as much on social supports, making us, see that little red box? Making us the whopping outlier. That's why the Benelux countries can do so much better. That's why Britain can do better. We deliberately set up the medical care system to be bloated, and you have to beg for supper. So the challenges to physician aid in dying for this population are in all three arenas. Competence, varying, equivocal, hard to assess, voluntariness in potentially coercive situations, and terminally ill, as we spoke about yesterday. So consider voluntariness. This is the one that I want to really focus on here. These are people who are facing impoverishment, the loss of their legacy. They built a little community store. It's going to go away. They have a ranch. It's going to be sold. I've had to sit with people who said, but I'm going to lose everything. And I say, I can't protect you from that. You are going to lose everything. You are going to lose everything spending down to Medicaid. You are going to have on the order of $45 a month to spend on pin money. And that's it. That is all you will have for years. Not just for this month, not for next month, for the rest of your life. I've had to sit with families who had to undergo divorce so as to protect the surviving spouse. Think about that. You've been married for 50 years, 60 years. Most states have now done in that particular one. Someone mentioned yesterday the conflict of interest in managed care. Conflict of interest in managed care is trivial compared to conflict of interest in nursing homes. Almost all nursing homes are for profit or owned by a community of some sort, state, county, city, all of which are financially strapped or first have to pay their, their shareholders. That's why the staffing is so low. 
The staffing isn't so low because somebody sat down and thought, gee, it would be nifty to have one aide running around taking care of 18 people who need help going to the bathroom. It's because we've set it up to pull the money out of the system and pay the investors, or we've set it up to be competing with roads and schools and everything else. So we have no affirmative way to say how much ought to be spent in long-term care. The critical element in long-term care is endurance. The critical care in long-term care is long-term. You stay with people for a very long time. And you stay with people for a very long time, watching them have no assets, watching them spend down. And in a nursing home setting where every single measure that CMS requires will look better if the person dies quicker. And the finances will be better. Talk about a conflict of interest. And we say to people, you, you have this wonderful choice. You know, you could choose just to be dead. Well, yeah compared to going 20 miles away with no public transportation so you can never see your family again, compared to going to a nursing home that will isolate you, compared to just sitting and waiting for death with no joy, no music, no art, no recreation. Those things all go by the way as we get uh, skinnier and skinnier. So people don't get offered the treatments that other people would get offered because of ageism and discrimination against disability. And, separately, they go, don't have good options. So what do we mean by voluntariness in this situation? So I'm a doctor. I work in this situation. I feel like I am being set up by the, by the country to have an impossible choice. And I want to actually read this to you. This is out of the brief that the American Geriatric Society put in in the Quill case. Most elderly persons experience serious and progressive illness for extended periods before death and need significant social, financial, and medical supports. These resources are too often not available. By collaborating and causing early deaths, geriatricians would become complicit in a social policy which effectively conserves community resources by eliminating those who need the services. By refu if that sounds a little bit like Nazi, it's meant to. By refusing because a patient's relative poverty and disadvantaged social situation is seen as coercive, geriatricians would condemn their patients and themselves to live through the patient's undesired difficulties for the time remaining. Elderly and frail persons would be put at risk, yet their concerns and interests have not been adequately addressed in the public discussion. And that's the main point. If we sit down and decide that we are not going to provide adequate support, then people ought to be making the decisions that advantage themselves and their families, which in many cases will mean an early death. If we don't make that decision, if we make a decision for adequate support, then people could make real choices. But if we make a decision to cut Medicaid, to cut the, down on the uh, regulations of nursing homes, to um, abandon people by having these enormous wait lists, then we are asking for this. Existing research in the US, there it is. <laughs> so far as I can tell, there is none. I've done the search. I can't find any. The closest thing we come is uh, Barbara's uh, data today. Research needed. We need to know what the current practices really are. There needs to be a vigorous discussion of what the current practices really are. We need to estimate the forces for ongoing change. You know, we can't just rest on our laurels saying, gee, there aren't any nursing home patients asking for this in Oregon and Washington. We have to be watching for what are the pressures, what are, the peop what are people feeling. We need the ethnographic kind of work. We need to really work on this conflict of ethics and values for the people in the field. I feel like I'm being asked to do in the needy persons rather than to support them for lack of the opportunity for support. And I think that that ought to be a very serious concern. I don't know how one goes forward. I think it is part of the reason why geriatrics is a dying field. Palliative care is growing because palliative care is kind of fun. Geriatrics is not so much fun working on the thin edge of poverty. Finally, we have no one who will sponsor or do the research needed. If you look at the mission statements of the National Institutes of Health, 
The mission statements are all about cure and prevention. None actually address how it is that people will live. PCORI won't fund it, AHRQ won't fund it, philanthropies won't fund it. We have no substantial research endeavors. I asked six major entities to come to give a talk at this about the needs for research, and all of them said, we don't have any idea what the research agenda would be there. We've never developed an agenda in this arena. So think about it. It's your future. It's the minority group to which we all aspire. <laughs>